Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's good to see so many uh, f uh, familiar faces in the audience. And thank you to the India Foundation for, uh, uh, for inviting me to speak here. Uh, I know you're at the end of a very long program, uh, many days, and you've heard from many uh, practitioners, and you will be hearing, I think, still from a few uh, uh, practitioners of, of, of government. Um, I, uh, I'm going to speak on a subject which is on a lot of people's lips. I just returned uh, a day and a half ago from Singapore, um, and we just had, of course, the India ASEAN Summit meeting here in Delhi. Um, and a lot of questions I get from many people, uh, both in Delhi, in India, um, but also abroad, uh, relate to a number of terms that you hear bandied about quite frequently in the press and in commentary. Um, and this includes uh, India's Act East policy, um, uh, Luki, pre previously uh, known as Look East, uh, the Indo-Pacific, um, and uh, the Quad. And so what I hope to do in just in the next 15, 20 minutes is just provide some context to some of these terms. Uh, this will overlap a little bit from what you will have heard uh, already from the ASEAN ambassadors and from um, uh, Ambassador Javed Ashraf and uh, uh, Preeti Saran and others. Uh, but uh, what I will try to do is actually just connect the dots a little bit because this is a very broad region um, with many uh, sometimes conflicting dynamics. Um, and so what I'll try to do is, 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 is uh, provide a more contextual picture. Um, just to start off a little bit, I think we have to, if you look back over the past 70 years of India's independence, um, one of the things I think we f often forget about now is that when India became independent in 1947, it found itself, uh, despite many problems and many, many economic problems, uh, in particular we had partition, um, but India found itself a natural leader in, in Asia. Um, it was at the vanguard of global decolonization. Um, it uh, had actually uh, many mature democratic institutions uh, and very, very soon in three years uh, promulgated a constitution in 1950 uh, that provided universal suffrage. And so for much of the rest of the world uh, coming out of the ashes of World War II, uh, particularly the, the developing world outside the United States and Europe, they actually looked to India for leadership. In February and March of 1947, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Indian National Congress at that time uh, organized a conference here in Delhi. Uh, and they uh, brought in leaders from across the region. And it was a very broad region from Turkey, uh, Iran, uh, Persia then, uh, to Indonesia, to Vietnam, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea, China, Tibet. Uh, and they brought them all here to Delhi. Um, and uh, in, in, at that time, uh, India was and became was able to position itself as the natural leader in Asia, and it actually acted upon that after independence. Uh, in 1950, India was actually uh, uh, the go-between between the United States and the People's Republic of China uh, in the run-up to the Korean War, uh, and India was involved in the repatriation of prisoners of war between North and South Korea. Uh, today, actually, if you were to go to the, uh, the Korean War Memorial in Seoul, there's an Indian flag flying in front of it um, as a testament to, to India's contributions. Uh, India, again, the, uh, often forgotten, uh, when there was a lot of resistance in Asia to bringing China into the community of nations, uh, communist China, uh, it was India that actually helped to uh, facilitate that in 1955 by, uh, by, by extending an invitation to China to the Bandung Conference. Uh, over the objections of many other countries, including the host Indonesia. Uh, and similarly, it was India that helped facilitate Japan's re-entry into the international community after uh, World War II. Uh, India was the first country that uh, agreed to receive aid, uh, overseas uh, development assistance, uh, from Japan, when many countries which had, uh, uh, were still, uh, where the, scar the wounds of World War II were still much stronger, um, refused to, to accept such aid. Um, and this, was, this is remembered by the grandson of then Prime Minister Kishi of Japan, uh, who uh, is now Prime Minister Abe of, of, of Japan. Um, of course, many, much of India's leadership really came to a, a very sudden end with the 1962 war and many of the miscalculations and mistakes that were made in the run-up to that. Um, and we saw basically from 1962 roughly to the early 1990s, India taking a much more inward 
uh, position. It focused very much on the immediate neighborhood, on Pakistan, on Bangladesh, uh, intervening in the, uh, to, to what, what became the Bangladesh War. Uh, in the Indian Ocean, uh, India, in fact, intervened in various ways in Sri Lanka, Maldives, Mauritius, Seychelles. Um, but was basically did not extend itself beyond uh, this, this immediate neighborhood in the Indian Ocean, um, either in military or economic terms. And the currency of, of power in Asia really became growth, uh, led initially by Japan, uh, then the four Asian tigers of South Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, and South Korea, uh, and then eventually China, mainland China, uh, starting with Deng Xiaoping's rep reforms in the early 1980s. Um, and so you saw in, in, in this conception of Asia that started to take shape between the mid early mid-1960s and, and the late 1980s, there was really no space for India. Uh, when you asked people in, in Singapore or Japan or China uh, about Asia, the India did not feature in their, uh, very strongly in their consciousness. And this was partly by design. India, uh, uh, by virtue of the, the, the nature of the Indian economy, uh, India did not play uh, the, 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 the kind, this kind of role. Now, circumstances started to change in the early 1990s after the end of the Cold War, after the beginnings of India's economic li liberalization. And we had the, the dawn of what was called the Lukist policy uh, under Prime Minister Narasimha Rao. And this was initially had a very explicitly economic objective. It was uh, a recognition that, that there was uh, uh, a certain economic dynamism in Asia. Uh, and so Rao went to South Korea, he went to Thailand, he went to Singapore, uh, he even went to China, uh, in large part to seek economic development uh, and, and, and nothing more. Uh, also to seek in some ways models uh, for uh, inspiration for India's own economic trajectory. And one of the immediate and very quick successes of this Look East policy was India's uh, eventual um, uh, institutional integration into Asia. So in the mid-1990s, India joined the ASEAN Regional Forum. Um, subsequently, it joined what became the East Asia Summit. Uh, and then eventually, the Asian uh, Defense Ministers, um, ADMM Plus, the, the Defense Ministers Dialogue. And so India became, with the exception of APEC, India became quite well integrated into the, the institutional architecture of Asia. Um, and I think that that is a testament in, to some degree of the success of, of India's Look East policy. Now, what happened in the early two th 2000s is the, the regional dynamics started to take on a slightly different view. And this is largely uh, related to the rise of China. Um, so while China's uh, economic, uh, um, uh, economic trajectory is really has been a pace setter, it has been a, uh, an inspiration, they've lifted the largest number of people out of poverty in history. Um, and there's a lot we can learn from that, and it's, it's been, we've, we've all directly or indirectly benefited from China's economic rise. But at the same time, it has also been accom accompanied by a few uh, characteristics, uh, which are causes for concern. Uh, China's uh, leadership has become more centralized. Uh, its governance structures have become more opaque. Uh, its economic policies, including e international economic policies, have become more mer mercantilistic and predatory in the form of the Belt and Road Initiative. It's become, when it comes to its territorial disputes, it's become more assertive and revisionistic, whether in the South China Sea, whether airspace in the East China Sea, or whether on land in the Himalayas, whether with India or, or Bhutan. Um, and uh, when it comes to international, well-established international norms, uh, whether on uh, non-proliferation, whether on freedom of navigation, whether on cybersecurity, we see China in regular violation of all of these. Uh, to the detriment often of Indian security. And so it's not simply, not just India, but many countries around the region have started to feel this dilemma, which is while we all benefit, uh, again, to different degrees and sometimes indirectly from China's uh, economic growth and prosperity and dynamism, uh, we also have uh, grave and increasing concerns about the implications of a dominant China and Asia. And it is in this context that India's Look East policy uh, transitioned into a, the Act East policy, uh, which uh, under, under Prime Minister Modi. And what, what Act East policy, and again, you may have heard this already from, uh, from Preeti Saran or somebody else, uh, what the Act East policy really, really signals is three things. Uh, one, it, it moves beyond economics to a more comprehensive engagement, including uh, particularly security. Two, it widens the scope 
um, from initially Southeast Asia and then Northeast Asia uh, to a much to, to a broader canvas, uh, what we might think of as the Indo-Pacific. Um, and three, it, if it, it necessitates a certain urgency, a certain action, uh, actionable item agendas. Um, and so I think that these, this really uh, is, is what differentiates the Act East policy from uh, its previous incarnation as a look East policy. Greater security, a wider scope, uh, and greater urgency. Um, the purpose of the Act East policy, even if it is not always explicitly stated this way, is to preserve a favorable balance of power in the Indo-Pacific region. Now this gets to the question of what exactly do we mean by the Indo-Pacific? Um, in recent years, you will have heard uh, uh, government officials from India, from Japan, from the United States, from Australia, all articulate the term Indo-Pacific. Uh, and to some degree, we all mean slightly different things by it. Uh, there are differences, for example, over the exact geographical scope. For Australia, the Indo-Pacific uh, basically refers to its maritime periphery. Uh, it, it has an Indian Ocean and a Pacific Ocean uh, coast. Uh, for the United States, they say explicitly in their national security strategy, which was just released, uh, that it runs from the west coast of India to the west coast of the United States. For Japan, it's a much more expansive canvas, covering two entire oceans, the Indian and Pacific Oceans, and two entire continents, the Asia, Asia and Africa. Um, and for India, I mean, while it hasn't articulated it, the geographical boundary so clearly, it's quite clear from Prime Minister Modi's own travels, uh, if nothing else, that it extends from the east, uh, the east coast of Africa, uh, the entirety of the Indian Ocean, and the western and southern Pacific Oceans. Uh, but despite these differences over the geographical scope of what exactly we mean, I think there's some areas of convergence between the, these four countries' visions of the Indo-Pacific. And there are really three areas, at least, where, where there's convergence. One, uh, it is a recognition that the Indian and Pacific Oceans form a singular strategic space. What happens in one of those oceans matters in the other. And so what happens in the South China Sea matters for India. Similarly, what happens in the Indian Ocean matters to Japan. Uh, two, it is a recognition that the future security and commercial dynamics will play out in the maritime space more than in, on land. Um, and by defining the, the region by the oceans rather than the landmass, this is a clear indication of the priority. Uh, and so for India, this means uh, achieving a greater focus on maritime trade uh, including port infrastructure, uh, but also on naval capabilities. And three, um, th I would say despite the fact that the Indo and Indo-Pacific refers to the ocean and not the country of India, uh, there really cannot be an Indo-Pacific without India in the mix. Uh, India is the largest economy in the uh, Indian Ocean, uh, the largest country. Uh, it is um, uh, uh, geographically at the centerpiece of, uh, the, of, of the Indian Ocean region. Uh, and uh, therefore, it's, a, it's an implicit recognition that uh, India is a balancer in the Indo-Pacific. So when you hear Donald Trump uh, speaking a speech in Vietnam and saying we are in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, it, is a rec it is an implicit recognition in his mind that India features somewhere in that balance of power. Um, and the same goes, I think, for all the other countries, including India. Um, what does acting East to preserve a favorable balance in the Indo-Pacific look like in practice? Um, I would say there are four essential elements to this. One, uh, it will mean for, Indi this is from an Indian perspective. Uh, one, it will mean uh, playing a more active role in ensuring that security competition is dampened in the Indian Ocean. Uh, we are already seeing China playing uh, a role, uh, inclu inclu increasingly a military role in the, Indi Indo uh, in the Indian Ocean. Uh, they have their first mi overseas military base in Djibouti there's an expectation that there'll be a second base at Gwadar. Uh, and there are other uh, infrastructure facilities, including in Sri Lanka, Maldives, Tanzania, and other places, which uh, are nominally civilian in nature, but uh, going by past patterns, it's, uh, there's always a possibility that they could be used for naval purposes as well, or dual use purposes. Um, and so India needs to uh, ensure that the security competition in this region does not uh, adversely affect Indian interests. And uh, to do this, uh, India is all establishing in some ways its own network of military infrastructure across the region, uh, including in the Seychelles and Mauritius. Uh, there are re reports even today of a possible such facility in Oman as well. 
Uh, India is also entering into agreements to access military facilities, including with Singapore, uh, with the United States, with France, with other countries across the Indian Ocean. Uh, India also has significant uh, bilateral and multilateral arrangements for um, monitoring um, uh, developments in this region, including uh, regular patrols in the uh, ec exclusive economic zone of Seychelles and Mauritius. Uh, and uh, 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 maritime domain awareness, multilateral um, facilities to improve maritime domain awareness. Um, and you see also Indian infrastructure and investment uh, and humanitarian assistance uh, now across the region, whether in, from Bangladesh uh, to uh, Sri Lanka to Maldives uh, to East Africa. Um, just to give you a few statistics, we now have about, uh, just in the last year, about $8 billion in lines of credit extended by the Indian Exim Bank uh, across the world, but, but a very large proportion of it is in the Indian Ocean region. Uh, about a billion dollars of uh, aid, grant aid, uh, again, primarily in South Asia. Uh, you have now the reinvigoration of non of, of new mechanisms for for governance, including the Indi Indian Ocean Rim Association uh, and BIMSTEC, the Bay of Bengal uh, Cooperation uh, in, uh, Institution. Um, so uh, these th this regionalism, uh, greater regionalism, uh, more humanitarian assistance and disaster relief efforts, uh, greater assistance and diplomatic, uh, meaning aid and diplomatic attention. Uh, are all parts of, of making the Indian Ocean, uh, ensuring that the Indian Ocean does not become uh, a, a region of heightened security competition. The second element is, is uh, engagement with ASEAN and the ASEAN member states, both bilaterally and multilaterally, and this was partly what the India ASEAN Forum was about. Uh, we saw uh, the, um, we have been seeing a greater, um, uh, greater pressures on ASEAN uh, which uh, grew in very uh, unusual circumstances. It, ASEAN really uh, evolved between the 1960s and 1990s uh, at a time when most of the great powers were distracted or, or, or not really asserting themselves in this region. And so they grew in a relative vacuum. Um, and this led to a situation where the small powers in Asia uh, are the institutional leaders, not the, not the major powers, uh, which is very unlike most other regions of the world. Um, what we're now seeing in some ways is the reassertion of the major powers in Asia, uh, the United States, China first and foremost, the United States, India, Japan, others. Um, and so the, the increasing pressures now on ASEAN as, and ASEAN centrality. Um, in, in some ways, India's own objectives are not, um, uh, are not in, uh, antithetical to ASEAN centrality, and so bolstering ASEAN uh, remains uh, an objective. Uh, Additionally, uh, India is providing uh, various kinds of economic, uh, military and security uh, assistance to several ASEAN countries. Um, India provides room uh, land uh, for the Singaporean armed forces to do exercises. It provides technical assistance to the Myanmar armed forces. It provides training uh, to the Indonesian and Vietnamese um, uh, militaries, and it does joint uh, uh, patrols with, uh, coordinate patrols with uh, the Thai um, uh, military in the Andaman Sea. Uh, and so these are just a few examples of some of the ways in which India is providing some assistance and cooperating with, with the Southeast Asian militaries. I would say one area that has not, go not been going so well is economic integration with Southeast Asia. Uh, trade uh, remains relatively flat, uh, trading goods. Uh, uh, connectivity is, is poor, whether land connectivity via Myanmar, uh, or air connectivity, which really uh, only applies to three countries with which there are regular direct, a large number of regular direct flights, which are Thailand, Malaysia, and Singapore, um, or uh, maritime connectivity for that matter. And so uh, a lot more needs to be done uh, to, for India to play the role of an economic balancer. Uh, just to give you some sense, India is the ninth largest trade partner of ASEAN, which is below Hong Kong and Taiwan. Um, so uh, th that uh, ASEAN engagement is, is a second important element. A third important element is uh, deepening security partnerships with like-minded uh, maritime powers in the region. And three are of utmost importance, uh, which are the United States, Japan, and Australia. Um, India's been doing a lot with all three countries in terms of deepening the defense partnership. Um, I'd say the US most, Japan a little bit less, and, and Australia uh, behind that. Um, but uh, uh, so at different rates and different uh, paces. 
Um, but um, there has been a, a lot uh, on the bilateral, trilateral, and now for the first time, again, quadrilateral uh, 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 cooperation amongst these countries. Um, uh, this extends to joint exercises to improve interoperability, um, to improve, uh, in, in, include staff talks and, and uh, uh, dialogues at the bureaucratic and political level um, to uh, exchange views on, on, uh, on issues. Uh, and at least with the United States so far, it also includes some capacity building efforts. Uh, this may also extend eventually to Japan and, and, and to Australia as well. Um, and, and, and so we are seeing in some ways uh, these four countries, again, either bilaterally or trilaterally, uh, uh, working together now in different contexts. Uh, a lot has been made of the quadrilateral dialogue, um, but I, I want to insert a few uh, notes of caution. Uh, there was a, a single meeting by uh, relatively junior officials from the uh, foreign ministries or external affairs ministries of the four countries a few months ago, uh, and, and nothing more than that. Uh, and so this represented only a very uh, early exploratory effort to, to, to see where there are potential areas of cooperation involving these four countries. Uh, the defense ministries are not yet involved. Uh, I think it's very premature to talk about there being any commitments or, or any kind of regular exercises involving all four countries uh, together. Um, so I think the agenda still needs to be worked out. Uh, but that being said, because uh, it was the first time in 10 years that these four countries were meeting together at the official level, um, it received a lot of attention in the Indian and, and international media. Um, the final element of, of Acting East involves, of course, maintaining a, a good, a stable, managing a stable relationship with China. And this is going to be increasingly difficult. Uh, we, are, we have seen assertiveness on the border. We have seen a growing trade deficit. Uh, we have seen uh, China doing increasingly things, including with Pakistan, that are run very much counter to Indian wishes and Indian sensitivities. Um, so managing this uh, bilateral relationship, whether uh, through a more, um, a more determined defense posture on, on the border, uh, whether by boycotting the Belt and Road Forum, as India did last year, um, uh, but also by keeping open lines of engagement and dialogue. Um, uh, will be important and will be a very tricky balance in the years ahead. So uh, just to sum up, I hope this uh, uh, provides a little bit of context for a few terms that you may be hearing a lot about, about ACT East, Indo-Pacific, Quad, uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions about these or other matters. Thank you. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, the bilateral exercise between India and the US yes. was being made trilateral with Japan's yes. uh, addition to it, but yes. because of China's apprehensions, Japan moved away a few years ago from the Malabar exercise. Uh, okay. So uh, while India is trying to engage with the ASEAN countries and overall East, how much does China's reaction figure into that calculus? Um, so actually what happened there was, was slightly different. Um, the, so uh, there isn't uh, a regular, it's sometimes held even twice a year, but usually once a year, uh, bi bilateral U.S.-India ex naval exercise called Malabar. Uh, it has traditionally been held alternatively between the Western Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean, uh, Bay of Bengal usually. Um, and uh, at times Japan has been invited to, to join. We, uh, the Malabar exercise in 2007 involved not, ju not just the United States and India, but also Japan, Australia, and Singapore as well. And China uh, expressed a great deal of uh, umbrage with that and, 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 and uh, sent demarches to the countries. Uh, since then, actually, uh, we, we saw it becoming a bilateral exercise with Japan occasionally joining. Uh, what has happened in, uh, in the last few years is India uh, has agreed to uh, allow Japan uh, to participate on a permanent basis. So it's effectively become a trilateral exercise just in the last few years on, on a permanent basis. Um, uh, Australia has still not been uh, included back in, although there's some talk of, of coming in as an, uh, in a, in a, uh, as an observer. Um, but to get to the larger question that you were asking, um, obviously China's responses do matter. Um, I think, I mean, one of the things that has changed in the last 10 years from 2007 to 2017 um, is that um, I, I think one of the lessons all of us, all these countries have learned uh, is that uh, uh, assuaging Chinese concerns have not led to uh, 
uh, change in Chinese behavior. Right, so uh, while at various points of time, uh, governments in all of these countries, I mean, uh, the, the DPJ governments in Japan, uh, the government here in India, uh, the governments of the United States and Australia as well, did things out of deference to Chinese sensitivities, uh, including slowing down the progression of a deeper partnership with, with the other actors uh, and, and with ASEAN countries. Um, and that uh, rather than leading to China being placated and, and playing, you know, becoming assuaged and less uh, concerned about, about the security implications, it has actually led to a more assertive China. So I think one of the lessons all of us have learned at our own pace, paces and rates is that uh, uh, deferring to Chinese sensitivities is not always the answer. Um, so I think we, we've all learned the lesson the hard way. It, 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 has taken, it has taken a decade to really absorb these lessons internally. Um, and I think there's still, it's still an open question. I think we will see, for example, probably a change in government in Australia soon. And uh, we'll have to see whether the new government, the opposition, which has been in the opposition, will necessarily follow uh, what, what the current government, which has taken a much tougher line with China, whether it would necessarily follow that. Um, but obviously in Southeast Asia, where the, many of the economies are much more dependent on, on China, uh, they have less room for maneuver. But I think we should not underestimate, um, again, I see a lot in the Indian commentary that much of ASEAN is in China's pocket. And I think, first of all, it shows a great deal of disrespect for the ASEAN member states. Many of them are, I mean, these are sovereign countries. Many of them are quite independent. Um, but uh, beyond that, I think it overlooks many important realities. Um, if, to give you some examples, you actually have um, uh, a military base uh, in Malaysia that has Australian and British uh, forces there. Uh, you have, uh, Malaysia also allows the U.S. to do maritime security patrols from, from uh, its territory. Uh, and that's just one country. But, I mean, in the Philippines recently, when you had an incident in, in the southern Philippines, uh, which, where, um, um, where uh, a, a town was overrun by uh, an Islamist group, uh, it was not the Chinese military that came to, to help. It was actually the U.S. and Australia and other forces, special forces, that came to help. Um, so I think we overlook the, the degree to which, uh, even in ASEAN, uh, the, 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 for, particularly on the security side, there's a great deal of dependence still on, um, on the United States, on, on Australia. And we overlook also how much Japan is a major economic player in these countries. So uh, I, I would just be a bit skeptical of this notion that China is suddenly ascendant and, and has a, a blank slate and, and is not receiving any pushback, because I don't think uh, in almost every one of these countries from Myanmar, to Sri Lanka, to we, we have seen at various points of time pushback against uh, against uh, Chinese assertiveness. Uh, okay, let me take four questions very quickly. Huh? So, sir, uh, uh, huh? you you mentioned uh, put the historical perspective. In 1962 and after that there was a disengagement, but so why is this time different? is something needs to be emphasized. So during the heady days of Asian Relations Conference mm. and Bandung Conference, mm. the, the framework was es essentially constructivist in nature, if I can put it this mm. way. Okay. It was about South-South cooperation and mm. other things. So even though we are talking about uh, rules-based international order mm. or we are talking about liberal democracies in terms of Quad coming together, mm. we, do we regularly need to emphasize that's it's also based on strategic convergence, or mainly essentially based on st strategic convergence, because that will not build the wrong kind of expectations out mm. of this block, right, right. and and the romantic notions will be kept away. Like sometimes I do see in Australian commentary, particularly, there is a romantic notion of Indo-Pacific. Mm. So yep. Is it necessary to keep emphasizing this sure. factor? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, let me just take a few more questions. I'll answer them all together because of uh, time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you uh, can you please uh, define in more concrete terms the India-Japan, particularly on the nuclear side, the mm. government of India and the government of Japan, mm. they have already announced yes. the you know joint working group, yes. having the representative from the Indian government, Japanese government, and yes. the and the representatives of the private company for the both sides. Mm -hmm. So just tell us the more inside how this joint working group is going to take forward in terms of the commercialization of the different projects between Japan and India. Thank sure. you. Um, I, back there, and then uh, the three more questions. So, uh, yeah, Poof, oh, please. 
uh, was on the Indian role in the current Korean crisis. You mentioned about India's important role in the Korean crisis of the 60s. Mm. What role does India have, if any, mm. in the current Korean crisis? Uh, why lay so much stress on the term Indo-Pacific? Uh, Ambassador Shyam Sharan in his book has used the term Asia-Pacific. Ambassador Ashok Kanta in this workshop used the term Asia-Pacific. Mm. And does this signify two streams of uh, experts who think like uh, uh, how do they see uh, India playing a role in the international relations? Yeah, last one. Yeah. Uh, Dhruva, you have mentioned about very three interesting things. When you talked about ACIS policy, you talked about three points, that is move beyond economics, mm -hmm. widening the scope, and the third factor is the necessity, which is certain actionable agendas. Mm -hmm. So coming down to your next points, that is on the convergence, you had said that uh, there will be much more uh, future security dynamics. And on the third part of your uh, I mean, uh, speech, you said that there is, again, another factor of maintaining and managing a stable relationship with China. Mm -hmm. So how do we see these three, the convergences and the further push to acting is playing out in this? Okay. Uh, no, all good questions. Um, I'll try and answer them very uh, briefly. Uh, so, so the question on hard power, uh, uh, the question on, on, on um, you know, the differences between Indian leadership in, in you know, from 1947 to 1962 and, and uh, more recently. Um, uh, look, I, I think there, there, are two, there are two differences and I, I, I appreciate uh, the way you characterize it. I mean, one is I think ultimately what, uh, the, the Indian, Indian leadership in, in that era uh, was uh, not necessarily backed by the fundamentals of power. Uh, hard, whether it's hard power, whether it was economic power, or something. You know, so so while India could play this leading normative role, um, and I mean, relatively speaking, I mean, again, India was rather impoverished, but so was much of the rest of the region at that time. We forget. I mean, even 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 in Japan, which was devastated from uh, World War II, um, but the uh, but still, you know, over that 15-year period, India, the the fundamentals of Indian power did not change. Now, again, we 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 underestimate. We you know, India was able to send a small. Uh, a small unit to medical unit to the Korean War, and you know had a role in the Congo and 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 so forth. And was providing assistance to in Indonesia to and you know anti-colonial uh, insurgents. Uh, so there was things that India was doing, but ultimately I, I think what 1962 exposed was the fragility of of, of Indian power. Um, and so I, that gets to the second part I think of, of your question, which is we still I think need to do some expectations management. Uh, in the sense that there, there, on the one hand, you know, there's a tendency to under underplay Indian strengths and underappreciate India's uh, potential contributions, uh, and we need to, you know, and I, I, when I meet with people from Southeast Asia and, and across the region, I, I try to uh, explain to them some of the things India actually is doing and has the capability to do. On the other hand, I think we should be realistic, and not suggest that India can be the balancer to China, uh, as I say, India can be. And India probably will be a balancer to China, but not the balancer to China. Uh, that in some ways we cannot replicate what China has done in Southeast Asia in terms of providing investment, in terms of... Um, so so while there, there is a little bit of expectation management that needs to be done, uh, absolutely. But I think that th that would really differentiate the two, which is we should, there should be a, uh, maybe narrow the gap between our expectation, our uh, rhetoric and our capabilities. And in an earlier iteration, perhaps that gap was too wide. Uh, on India Japan um, you know I mean it, it's a it's a it's been a, a pretty dramatically d a deepening security partnership uh, we're going from 20 years ago uh, Japan after the nuclear test Japan was at the forefront of uh, insisting on international sanctions against India and so we've come really full circle to the point of having a civil nuclear agreement with with Japan in 20 years in two decades uh, and it's particularly sensitive with Japan as a country that has very strong public opinion views on on um, on the fact that India is a, a state with nuclear weapons um, in terms you know so we, we just had a very quick entry into force of the civil nuclear agreement um, the one of the, the big implication will actually be on the cost of civil nuclear energy because unless you bring Japan Japan is part of the global uh, ecosystem um, uh, for 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 civil nuclear energy and and without Japan's 
uh, without the civil nuclear agreement, the cost for India would be higher. Um, I th my understanding is the holdup is still very much on the Indian side and has to do with nuclear liability and also public, frankly, public concerns about, about civil nuclear energy. Uh, and until those can be partly addressed, I think we will see some slow. So, so I don't think it's Japan specific. It, we we have the same issues with Russia. We have the same issues with others. Uh, so so I, I would I would not hold my breath uh, for for any uh, immediate progress. But down the down the line, we we should see some. Money. We, we that that remains to be seen. I think it's we're very early stages. We've just had the implementation, the the, the entry into force of of the civil nuclear uh, agreement. Um, on the Korean crisis, a uh, good question. You know, uh, it, it appeared in the news uh, last year that India was the third, at least uh, on paper, the third largest trade partner of North Korea. Uh, and uh, I think this surprised a lot of people. It was about $100 million of trade, so not a huge amount. Um, in April of last year, the government issued, um, uh, b basically said that there would be a suspension of all uh, commerce with North Korea, barring food and medicine. Um, and I think that that seemed to assuage concerns in other countries that India was somehow playing a role. I mean, it, by the way, these the statistics totally ignore much of the unofficial trade that goes on with China, via China and Russia uh, with, with North Korea. Um, I think India has become more outspoken about um, uh, the concerns about North Korea. Uh, you saw this in joint statements with Japan and in multilateral statements. Uh, equally, India has also tried to uh, make the case that we have to look at this more comprehensively. And that part of uh, that means sometimes the sources of uh, uh, that have that helped to support in uh, the progression of North Korea's nuclear program, and that's largely China and and in the past Pakistan as well. Um, and it's it's still quite remarkable how how much the rest of the world focuses on the North Korean nuclear pro program without looking at uh, the the larger context of it. So I think that that is India's. I mean, there's not an immediate security threat. We have diplomatic relations with North Korea. We have an embassy in Pyongyang. But um, I, 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 so, so while it is something to, to remain concerned about because it is such a major regional security issue and uh, also directly involves so many now partners of India. Um, but um, that being said, uh, I think it is a secondary concern uh, for India. And I think you know, while India should be cooperative in efforts to, to uh, ensure that North Korea does not uh, it is, there's not a destabilization of, of uh, the Korean Peninsula, uh, that equally uh, the, the, the larger picture needs to be kept in mind. Um, and, and again, quite often, I, I've had so many conversations with South Koreans who are completely unaware of, of uh, the past uh, proliferation uh, activities involving Pakistan with, with North Korea. So there's a lot more to do to highlight some of, some of these. Uh, on the Indo-Pacific, Asia-Pacific, I mean, I think what happened, um, it's interesting, in what happened really in the last, under the last government um, in, in India uh, was um, a little bit of a debate on, on the use of the term Indo-Pacific. And it became a proxy for uh, a debate on how much, on, on China policy largely. Uh, several people felt and maybe continue to feel that the use of the term Indo-Pacific uh, drags India into um, a containment strategy or quasi-containment strategy of China. Uh, it drags it into Japan's problems and into the U.S.'s problems into which India should not or, or cannot afford to be involved in, including in the South China Sea. Um, I think proponents of the use of the Indo-Pacific say, look, this is a reality. China is in the Indian Ocean. Uh, so now we, we have to start thinking about this as a single strategic space. Um, and so, you know, for example, just to give you a sense, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Raja Mohan is a big advocate of the use of the term Indo-Pacific. His book, Samudra Mantan, which came out in 2012, was made good use of, uh, made a case for it. Um, he was criticized at the time by, amongst others, uh, the then National Security Advisor, Shiv Shankar Menon, who said that he, he did not buy into that concept. Um, uh, I, I, I rather suspect Prime Minister Manmohan Singh was actually quite keen on it, and in fact he used the term Indo-Pacific in a speech in Tokyo uh, in 2013. Um, so I think there was, we saw in the last government a bit of a debate, uh, uh, sometimes subterranean debate on, on the use of the term, and really it was about China, it was a proxy for, for what, what you think you should do in response to China. Uh, but uh, I think in this government, we've seen Prime Minister Modi now use the phrase multiple times. This seems to, it has great, gained broader acceptance and official uh, rhetoric. Uh, so I think you are partly correct in, in, in suggesting that the use of the term. Um, I just came back from a conference in, in, in Singapore, and I have to say everybody was using the term Indo-Pacific except for the Chinese, who still insisted on using Asia-Pacific. So take, take of, make of that what you will.
Um, uh, finally, uh, so I could just rephrase the question just a little bit. I, I just want to get, so I, I understand the context that I, I laid out what the agenda is and what and, and that part of it involves maintaining a, yeah. a good relationship with China, but specifically, what, what would you like me to address? Uh, I would like you to address that uh, when we talk about acting east, yes. and we are uh, talking about both maintaining bilateral as well as multilateral ties with ASEAN. Yes. So how does the role of China play yes. out when you are saying about, because you mentioned in your fourth, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, of engagement, that we should also maintain and manage a stable relationship yes. with China. Mm -hmm. So how do we see this? So, yeah. so I mean, uh, look, I, I think there are four elements to the India-China relationship. There's the bilateral security relationship, which is r largely the border issue um, and, and the border dispute. Uh, the second is uh, the regional security issue, which is you know now basically can be subsumed under the Belt and Road Initiative, Pakistan uh, China, basically. China doing things in Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Maldives, um, and other places which are sometimes inimical to Indian interests. Um, the third element is the bilateral economic relationship, and we have a 70 billion roughly trade uh, relationship uh, between bilateral trade relationship between India and China, but a major trade <laughs> deficit in, in uh, or a trade surplus in China's favor, a, a trade deficit for India. Um, and the fourth is on multilateral issues and global governance. Um, and on this extends to climate change, freedom of navigation, um, uh, IMF, uh, UN Security Council resolutions, and so forth. And uh, you know, five six years ago, if you had to describe the India-China relationship, you'd say the two areas of of competition, uh, bilateral security and regional security, and two areas of broad cooperation, which is economics and trade, and 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 multilateral issues. Um, I would say, if we were to characterize the relationship today, all in all four dimensions of that relationship have gone in an, a negative direction. Uh, we have greater assertiveness on the border. We have greater, uh, you know, China playing a, a much more active role regionally. Again, not always, usually, uh, some, sometimes in, in alignment with Indian interests, but off, quite often not. Uh, on, on multilateral affairs, we've seen a parting of the ways, largely as for, for, for the most part because China sees itself now as a, um, as, as a power in a different league from India. Um, and on bilateral economic issues, we've seen uh, a widening of the trade deficit. We still have lack of market access to uh, China. Uh, um, State-owned enterprises there don't um, don't uh, hire Indian firms, um, and so you see even the Indian business community increasingly frustrated with with China, which a few years ago they saw as a major opportunity. Um, now, I mean, I think this is the context in which we have to see how to manage this relationship. Um, and I think, you know, part of it will mean sort of being clear about red lines. Uh, part of it is about Indian delivery. We need to step up and deliver on, on a whole range of issues. Um, part of it is deepening partnerships with others, finding alternatives, whether on the economic or security front. Um, so I think all of that is part of it, you know, at the, uh, ultimately also f uh, cooperating on areas of converge and convergence. So, for example, on climate change. Um, if India is to meet its own targets on uh, for its national solar plan, it, it's almost impossible to do without imports from China. Um, and China is glad to uh, export to, to India, in, in, at least in this area. So, so I, th I think there are still some areas of convergence and cooperation. The, those areas are diminishing. Um, but we need to be, ca you know, having a candid conversation with our Chinese counterparts is, I think, a big part of it. Uh, saying there are red lines that, that should not be crossed by China and pushing back, and we saw that happen in Doklam. Um, so I, I think that uh, that will all be part of managing it, but I don't think there's a single silver bullet solution to, to getting the, the bilateral uh, India-China relationship right. Thank you.